Reformed Protestant, uh, ethnically from Syriac, Aramaic roots, and culturally Arab. Over the past 20 years, he has traveled widely and had a chance to fully integrate into various Western cultural contexts. He has lived in England, United States, and then Germany before settling in the United States uh, over two years ago. He sees himself as the child of this wonderful and successful marriage between his Eastern origin and Western experience. Okay. First, I'd like to invite Professor Lin. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, two for one, three in one. That was pretty nice. I never thought of it that way, but well, and it's just perfectly apropos uh, this particular occasion tonight. Uh, it's a great, great delight and privilege for me to be here with you today. Uh, partly because I, 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 I knew, I thought I knew a lot about Harvard Seminary from what I've heard from colleagues and friends about its rich history of uh, Christian and other religious traditions and engagement, be it in missions and interfaith dialogue. So I didn't realize that the school has been in existence and operation for about 180 years. That is older than my own university, so uh, my current employer at Vanderbilt. And, and just going downstairs to see the plaques and uh, sort of the emblematic kind of presence of these, uh, you know, I don't want to say patron saints, because I'm you know, leaving patron saints, but you know, those who had gone before this particular uh, group of folks here and students and staff and faculty. So I think it is a great privilege to be invited to talk about. Uh, this meager book of mine, but I'm also quite excited to learn from Professor Alan about his own book uh, on modern theological terms to the trade. So I'm a historian who cares about theology, uh, and there's always been this kind of uh, back and forth in my own career. When I went to Cambridge for my PhD, my advisor was in the divinity faculty, but also joint appointment in history faculty noted that for a historian I care too much about theology and then for a theologian I care too much about history. So he said, you know, that's going to be your career trajectory. But for now, I want you to focus on writing a good history thesis or dissertation. Thus, my first book on Richard Baxter's Ecclesiology in the 17th Century Context. But after, and as I was finishing my dissertation, I had a lot of questions. A lot of questions about this Puritan minister named Richard Baxter who was often criticized, in fact, quasi eradicated by his uh, would-be opponents, and in fact, uh, his real opponents, mostly Restoration bishops, uh, that he was really soft on the Trinity. Now, let me backtrack and, and speak in general terms. Now, at one level, I have no dog in this fight as to whether one believes in the Trinity or not. That's not why I wrote this book. I was interested in the, the contemporary, then contemporary, the 16th and 17th, 17th century debates about the tenability uh, of believing in the doctrine of the Trinity, be it the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, these persons, three persons in eternal perichoretic communion, which I'm sure we'll hear more about. These ideas that we think about these days, some of us as we do, I have long pedigree. In fact, in this book, I began, so basically what I had to do was to retool myself, retrain myself in patristic thought, patristic theology. So basically, kind of, I had Latin going, but then my Greek, uh, patristic Greek was really quite weak, so I had to kind of basically uh, learn a new discipline. Because what I realized pretty immediately was that the figures that I was studying were a whole lot smarter than me in terms of their linguistic competence, in terms of their philosophical adroitness, they far out, out, you know, outmatched me. So it was a really an exercise in uh, kind of educational humility, learning a lot from these voices. And I tried to make it very clear that I wasn't going to take sides. Because my theologian friends who care about the Trinity, for, for instance, asked me, why don't you tell in your saying in your book why the anti-Trinitarians are wrong? I said, you know, that's not my, my purpose. I'm a historian. I want to kind of tell you why they fall over this doctrine. Why do they think it was so important to fight over and imprison and sometimes pay with one's own life? 
1698 in the city of Edinburgh, there was a guy in, in Scotland, there was a gentleman named Thomas Aikenhead who was executed for his refusal to believe and subscribe to the doctrine of the Trinity. 1698. That's about 300 years ago, 316 years ago to be exact. That's not that long ago. Then what are some of, let's assume that some of you do believe in some fashion of the tri divine triad or divine identity being found in the Trinity. How do you uh, espouse it? How do you explain that mystery? Because throughout the history of Christian traditions, Eastern and Western, there is this core belief that God is ultimately a mystery. There is a kind of eternity of God that is God, if God is such that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then one plus one plus one simply could not be one. Because simple mathematical formula would, would lead one to believe that maybe one plus one plus one equals three. Now what I'm telling you here is the belief of many of the anti-Trinitarians. who are steeped in Renaissance humanism, who began to kind of expand and expound on this idea of historical critical methodology of looking at the sacred text. They began to realize, okay, we got, a, we got this grammatical and lexical and other methodological apparatus that are being discovered and further elaborated upon. And we need to use that and harness that in order to get to the core of the sacred roots meaning. And many of the anti-Trinitarians began to say, wait a minute, as we study the Bible, what became very, very clear for many of these anti-Trinitarians was that Jesus was a very, very exalted figure, very close to God indeed. Indeed, he was the representative of God here on earth, but that Jesus, even though he was a mediator of redemption, could not be very God. So in this book, in, in my 20-minute presentation, I'd like to take three kind of approaches or three themes. One will be exegesis, so biblical exegesis. Second will be tradition or history of doctrine. Third point will be about politics. Because we often don't think about theology and politics. But if I learned anything in my studies of early modern England, politics of religion, was a very large issue. That it was that, I mean, you think about the Anglican Church or the Church of England, it was somebody's marital problems that led, led to the birthing of this new church. And Henry VIII being eradicated by the Pope and severing of its tie. And if you think about that, then one of the major apologetic aims of the early kind of theologians of the Church of England was to establish its own apostolicity. You know what I mean? That it has its own apostolic origin that bypassed the Church of Rome. Because for these individuals in, in, in early modern Europe, primitivity or primitiv primitivism was not a dirty word. When we use the word primitive today, right, we think of it as somewhat derogatory and pejorative. They were still primitive, right? But then in this time period, and many, a lot of the restoration churches, they believe that what we are trying to do is we instead see the church of Jesus and Mary and Paul and so on. That means you're trying to go back to the New Testament period. You try to re instantiate the church in the book of Acts or something of that sort. Because there the church might have fallen asleep in the bosom of Constantine. So you really want to bypass this whole kind of horrid period of corruption and go back to the time period of Jesus. So many of the anti-Trinitarians said something like this. That if you actually go to the period of Jesus, Mary, and Paul and the early church, you will not see, you will not see the doctrine of the Trinity writ large in the pages of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament or the New Testament. What you will find is a divine monad, the Father, out of his love for this created order, sends his one and only begotten Son, who was of virgin birth and so forth and so on, but nonetheless, nonetheless, he was not God himself, but the highest order of creation itself. Now, how did these anti-Trinitarians arrive at their conclusion? Uh, they were basically steeped in biblicism. You know, as one of the kind of uh, battle cries of the Protestant Reformation was sola scriptura, that it was going to be the Bible and the Bible alone that'll be the tool and offering 
helping them in this sort of you know spiritual trajectory uh, for their own kind of wayward uh, for their journey toward the city of God. It is the Bible. It's the exegesis. And you know, of all the biblical texts, guess which book got more attention by both the anti and pro Trinitarians? Let's narrow it down to the New Testament. Which book in the New Testament do you think might have gotten the most attention? There's somebody who said, go ahead, please. Galatians. Revelation. Close. Let's go further back to the Yes. The Gospel of John. Why would you say that?
hardly any Trinitarians are convinced by the anti-Trinitarian argument. And hardly any anti-Trinitarians are convinced by the Trinitarian argument. Now, this is as, as a historian speaking. Now, what I think about these matters as a Christian is somewhat irrelevant for me, at least for now, as a historian. I mean, as, I, as someone who cares about Christian theology, I do have my, <clears throat> I do have my own personal opinion, but that will maybe come in later. So as to Jesus, it seems that both these sides were intensely kind of steeped in biblical tradition. So it's not as if these anti-Trinitarians are kind of a mechanic creatures who know anything of and unlearned and uncouth and uneducated. No, far from it. They were taking their degrees from Oxford and Cambridge and Edinburgh and so on and, and Salamanca. Uh, at the same time, many of these pro-Trinitarians, uh, Trinitarians, were also taking up degrees and and it's, they, were, they were always going through the same text. They were always kind of looking at then what is it about their different trajectory? I'd like to read something from uh, from my book because it is someone else. I'm citing someone else. I feel pretty good about that. Um, so it's uh, John Cardinal Newman. It says, The church's most subtle and powerful method of proof for the divinity of Jesus, therefore the Trinity, whether in ancient or modern times, is the mystical sense. Now, in turning to primitive controversy, he writes, we find this method of interpretation to be the very basis of the proof of the Catholic doctrine of the Trinity. So, what does that mean? He says, it may be almost laid down as a historical fact that the mystical interpretation and orthodoxy on the Trinity will stand or fall together. It's on page 279. What does that mean? When I first read that from Newman, it just blew me away. What Newman was saying was that the school, the, the exegetical, the catechetical school of Alexandria, as opposed to the Antiochian school, the mystical interpretation, how you would read the Old Testament through the lens of, you know, the fourfold meaning of scripture and so forth and so on, was the only way to buttress the doctrine of the Trinity. That I found really interesting. Now, I don't know whether I agree all with me, but it really kind of got me thinking about how we, the sort of exegetical and hermeneutical method, how we read a certain text, and the methods we employ to read a certain text, be it the New York Times or part of the Quran or the Quran or the New Testament, I think the methodology we employ would also have a very clear kind of a, a, a influence in the way that we end up reading the text and inhabiting and interpreting them as well. Let's then go to the second part, uh, which is tradition or history of doctrine. So, you know, if you had, somebody asked me recently at, at, at Rotterdam, this summer at the Erasmus University of Rotterdam, um, the, there's a growing on uh, kind of studies group, and they read uh, a couple of these chapters. And one of the questions that, that one professor had was kind of an interesting one. He said, what chapter did you like writing the best? And I said, you know, I can tell you most emphatically there is one chapter I like the best, and that's chapter 5. And it's entitled kind of Bishops Behaving Badly with a question mark. <laughs> Hobbes, Baxter, and Marvell on the problem of conciliar history and the nature of heresy. Because I used to think that the whole Trinitarian debate was an exegetical debate, the biblical text, and they were fighting over that. I used to think that that's all it was. But then, you know, I learned as I was reading Thomas Hobbes and Richard Baxter and Andrew Marvell from the standpoint of their meta critique of these councils, ecclesiastical councils. And where was the doctrine of the Trinity formulated? If you remember, the Council of Nicaea, right? 325. Now, many of the Trinitarians then and now have argued, no, 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 it's not there. It was, in fact, in the all embedded in the pages of Scripture. And it was codified in Nicaea. So that means you have a continuity of kind of interpretation. You believe that there's a continuity between what the scripture teaches about God and what people found out in 325. But there are people who are discontinuity or rupture kind of mode of looking at the history of Christianity. And that is, you know, the Bible never really endorsed the Trinity. It never names it. It never explicitly says the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in the way that it affirms that they're all God. Okay, maybe the baptismal sacramental formula, but that's a far cry from a kind of clear ontological proof of God as three in one. And they said, well, in fact, these history of councils tell us, these histories of councils 
tell us that these bishops were often thugs, and they would beat up on those opponents of that, you know, theirs. And as they beat up on their opponents, winners write history. Some of you are my age will know how. And they have a you know, song called Winner Takes It All, right? You know what? You probably I don't know, you remember this one. Yeah, right. You know what they were saying for it was sort of a karaoke session over there, but winner takes it all. Do winners write history? What about losers? What about history of, you know, history is written by the losers of history? Is conciliar history, the history of counsel, written from such a vantage point to reflect the perspective of the winners? So that there will be some epitome of losers peppered throughout the history of Christianity who said, wait a minute here. You say that's how it is, but we don't think so. In fact, we know, Thomas Hobbes writes and Baxter writes as well, and Marvell, that you know, when you look at the history of council, it is these thuggish bishops who basically eradicated those who wouldn't agree with them. And so they kind of began to chip away at the credibility of conciliar history. So again, I used to think that it was primarily about exegetical disputes and debates, and that's how anti-Trinitarian uh, kind of ideas, and thus in some ways, kind of modernity and modern outlook on self and state in society kind of arose. But I realized, you know, even before Edward Gibbon, writing about you know, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, even before that, this critical methodology of looking at history, looking in particular at the conciliar history, not as a kind of a history of sacred councils where God was present, but looking at this conciliar history as the very birthplace of bad ideas, ideas that were departures from primitive orthodoxy that Jesus knew and taught. They were very big on this. The anti-Trinitarians said Jesus would never ever claim to be equal with God. Then I think as our as our friend said, but then what about some of these Johannine texts? And so it's, they, they would always say things like they were the same in mission. They were same in purpose, one in purpose, not one in essence. So if you follow some, I mean, as I follow some of these debates, it's really head spinning, you know, because they, but one, one of the things that I really found interesting was the Hobbes in his uh, Historia, uh, Historia Ecclesiastica says that these bishops, they became really intoxicated with their desire for power. And they would kind of come up with ideas that would be so sublime that the laity will be kept at sort of in the dark. Because if you say the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the three is in one, it would be confusing. But then because of the priestcraft, that they were interested in, they were power-mongering bishops. And they really wanted to make sure that they had something that they only they could explain. Right? Because you know, I mean, the knowledge is power, no? Right? The knowledge is power. And the, the priest would say, the bishops would say, you don't know, but trust us. Trust me, I know. Let me tell you. Then the power of the differential can be maintained. So one of the things that I found about Hobbes and Marvell and Baxter is that they really kind of began to see the history of the church as a sort of a long durée fight over power differential. And you're going to use the doctrine of the Trinity to keep me in the dark because every time you kind of cry out mystery, and who can explain that, you know, it's that phrase, hocus pocus, right? Hocus pocus, man. It's like, how do you explain the Eucharistic formula? Well, the priest, when he lifts up the altar, and there's that kind of moment of consecration, then according to God's promise and power, those elements that are quotidian elements of bread and wine get turned into, transubstantiated into what? The body and blood of Jesus. So the anti trinitarian said this is the three things. Three T's I call it in the book. Tradition, transubstantiation, and the Trinity. And if you think about many of these Protestant Trinitarians, they had problems with tradition and transubstantiation. So these anti-Trinitarians would say, come on, go all the way. I mean, I'm sort of not far from the ESPN country, and one of my favorite ESPN commentators, Chris Burke, you know, the guy who always says, go all the way, right? And so these anti-Trinitarians are saying, why don't you go all the way? Add another T in your arsenal. Deny the Trinity, because you're already denying tradition and transubstantiation. If you're a true Protestant, you want to get as far away from popery as possible, then what you ought to do is deny the Trinity as well. 
Because if you study anything about the history of Christianity, they would have heard. You would have to conclude, there's an inescapable conclusion that, ah, the history of Christianity is peppered with all these sordid individuals who wanted to grab power in the name of God and abuse it. And what better way than to grab onto the Trinity and say, it is mystery, only we can explain it for you. So please sit down there and let me stand up here and explain it to you. If you don't understand it, we'll come back next week. So they kept a hold of the laity. And so it became a very powerful way of understanding history for the anti Trinitarians. Then what about the Trinitarian response? They said, no, 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 no. God, the Holy Spirit, was with the church, the bridegroom of the bride of Jesus, all the way through, even when it seemed like the church was in abeyance and absent from this world. But God, the Holy Spirit, was still carrying it. In his bosom and carrying it toward eschatological, toward the eschatological glory. So it, I think it was a very interesting debate between these two parts. Exodus, firstly, secondly, tradition. Now it leads me to politics. Um, so I need to say something about my own kind of intellectual kind of um, genealogy. I grew up an atheist. Um, unlike uh, I, you know, my father was a political prisoner in South Korea. Um, so when I was nine years old, my father was going to jail for three years. And so from nine, every six years, I had a major rupture in my life. At nine, the first rupture was my father's incarceration. At age 15, the second rupture was uh, immigration to America. I thought living in America would be great. In some ways, it was great, but my high school years were dark. My high school years were desolate and desperate. Went to high school in Cherry Hill West. It could have been anywhere for me. It was really tough. At age 21, the third rupture happened. That's I became a Christian. <laughs> you know, it was a really an interesting dialectical existential tension. I thought about becoming a Christian, I'd be a happy man. Well, that's for sure at one level. But then I lost a lot of things, made me friends. Many of my friends at Yale were not Christians, and I lost a lot of them. But one of the things that they kind of began to do for me was to really kind of uh, look at my life in the light of the revelation given to, to me through Jesus Christ and Scripture. So I had a very kind of, I don't want to say naive understanding of Christianity, but I was just excited about Jesus. I was excited that I found the meaning of my life. Existence is not just about getting drunk and getting Grades and you know, it's not like that, right? I mean, I lived with first two students at Vanderbilt, and one of the students put it so epigrammatically at least uh, about a couple of years ago. He was, you know, getting uh, into trouble, and I talked to him and said, You know what? Why aren't you here? I mean, you're here to pursue a great education and make something of yourself. And he looks at me, he goes, Professor, I'm here to get three things. And his rated R, I think all of you are rating himself. So. He said, I'm going to get good grades. I'm here to get drunk, and I'm here to get laid. <laughs> Some people are not in here. And then I asked him, is, is that it? And then you know what he said? Is there anything more? <laughs> I will never forget that exchange. Because in a way, he was actually speaking for a lot of people who watched and enjoyed Jersey Shore and things of that sort. Is there anything more than that? I think there is. I think there is more, more, more to life than that, but one of the things that I be, began to be slightly disillusioned by, or began to scratch my head is, I thought that Christianity was all about just you and Jesus, I call the I call, you're in love with God, and you're in love with everything, and there's no politics involved, and everyone just uh, operates out of pure motives. <laughs> and then I began reading the history of Christianity. Mind you, not like a sort of a cleaned up version. Reading primary source materials and, I mean, just the, the, the ferocity and the fierce nature of some of these debates and what they're calling for. The pro Trinitarians, Trinitarians were calling for the heads, literally heads of these anti Trinitarians. Now, before I say anything negative about that, I began to raise this question what was at stake, right? And plan fully intended, salvation was at stake. These Trinitarians felt that these, you know, voices ought to be heard because they will muffle the, the voice of the, the Lamb of God calling us unto himself. But then what I realized was that, you know, these debates
beliefs about the Trinity were also enmeshed with the political back and forth. Let me read from uh, Yaroslav Kalikan, one of the authors um, who um, influenced my way of thinking a lot. Uh, on page 79 of my book, I'm quoting from Yaroslav Kalikan, who used to be the historian professor of history at Yale. He, he says uh, that the unchallenged theological hegemony of the doctrine of the Trinity, beginning in the 4th century and ending in the 18th and 19th centuries, was coextensive with the willingness and ability of civil authorities to go on in Forcing it. Did you hear that? So, according to Kalibak, and I'm, you don't have to take it as orthodox truth, he says, okay, when you think about the period when the doctrine of the Trinity was regarded as truth, was when there was civil authority who would say, you don't believe it? Come here. You're in jail. You don't believe that? You lose your job. It was true that if you did not believe in the Trinity, you could not hold out a professorship at Oxford Cambridge. That was one of the cardinal doctrines of Christianity that you had to profess. So the, the whole political, and then in the 1640s, so in, during the English Civil War, and the period of uh, 1650s, the period of Oliver Cromwell and Interregnum, there was much back and forth as to whether anti-Trinitarianism should, that anti-Trinitarianism should be a capital offense. Now we might find it and say, well, really? Yes, really. I'm not making a valid judgment about it at all. But all of that to underscore the fact that one thing I discovered was yeah, there was a lot of, I mean, if you think about the Council of Nicaea, you know who called that council together? Constantine. Yes, Emperor Constantine. What was he? He was a politician, no? He was the emperor. He was going to adjudicate some of his community claims while listening very carefully to the bishops and to the presbyters from all over. It was from the outset a political affair. I don't mean by political something dirty, something inexorably corrupt. It means that when the two, two or three people are together, not only is Jesus in the list, but also there is a burning of politics. So the political issues were really, really rich for me as I studied this book. I mean, studied and wrote this book, and I learned so much about at least why some of these people were opposing the doctrine. And also at the same time, by some of the of how defenders of the Trinity felt that so much was at stake that they had to put those naysayers about the Trinity in prison and lock them up and throw away the key. It is a period in which uh, a lot of the modern notions about freedom, about liberty of conscience. So whether Thomas Hobbes or John Locke or many other and the whole the, the you know Rene Descartes and Spinoza, it is within this particular historical in my book, uh, Knuff is unfolding its own narrative. That anti-Trinitarianism is one of the very interesting ways of looking at the birth of modernity. When you, the whole idea, and thus the book, Mystery Unveiled, just wanted to explain this, this kind of thing came from one of my colleagues. This is Thomas touching the side of Jesus, right? So it is the kind of prototypical empiricist, unless I touch it, I am not going to believe it. It almost became axiomatic for these anti-Trinitarians that unless you can prove it to me from scripture without ever resorting to mystery, because for the anti-Trinitarians, you cannot say it's mystery, because if I don't understand it, it cannot be true. If the Bible doesn't teach it, then I'm not going to believe it. No amount of, no number of historical accounts of considered decrees or people who are powerful bishops, it ain't going to do it for me, because it has to be me and Jesus, I the Bible through the mediation of the Word of God in the Bible. So that's why I wrote it, and uh, I was most shockingly surprised when, I won, when it won the Rome Painting Prize as a Yale professor, and, and I was just really humbled by it. And uh, as a result, I'm going around talking about this book, and uh, I always feel like, you know, uh, I don't feel bad about people buying the book for the book itself, but it's very expensive, so I appreciate those who would buy it. And, uh, but thank you for the invitation. I, I'm really looking forward to learning from Professor Allah. Thanks a lot. Well, after a very exciting and stimulating presentation, what shall I say? <laughs> um, before I start my presentation, I'm going to stick to the 20 minutes I put my press to do that. I would like to uh, thank you all for coming over. Uh, to listen to Professor Lem and me talking about our books. Um, 
doctrine of the Trinity um, is popular today because it's controversial, <laughs> not because it is understandable to us. Um, let me, before I start my presentation, um, share with you some background about what I'm going to talk about today. I um, was between two options, either speak about something or a subject related to the book, or actually explain a bit within 20 minutes what is in the book. And I opted for the second option. And I tell you why. Uh, the book was published in May 2014. And since that time, I've been receiving emails from uh, scholars or students of theology who read. And they were really enriching me with long emails discussing the content. And they would start there. Many of them were started with this line saying, I thought this book is, was going to be on the doctrine of the Trinity. But actually, it's not. And that's why I felt I, I need maybe to share with you what is the book about and how is it really used in the book. <clears throat> but um, as you can see, the name of my book um, as published is Persons and Relation, an essay on the Trinity and Ontology. This is the name that has been chosen by the publishers. <laughs> the name of my, <laughs> my project is actually when I started writing the draft and when I submitted it to Fortress Press was beyond hype or music. But they said to me, uh, this is not sellable, this is not a marketable <laughs> title. But um, the title was deliberate, actually, beyond hype or music. Uh, it wanted to say that what I'm trying to talk about is the relation of theology as a field of study and the of Trinity within it to other forms of intellectual inquiry and whether the relation between them should be a relation of submission or a relation of control. That's what hierarchism thing. Um, so, so the title may give the implication that this book is about exploring the Trinity. It's basically not actually about that. The book is an exploration by means of the trend, by means of the trend. Um, it's not basically a, 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 a study of the doctrine of the Trinity per se, but a study from the perspective of the two specific notions of personhood and relationality that are conceptually inherent to the content of the doctrine of the Trinity. We speak about persons, you know, in one nature, or you speak about father, son, and spirit related in the relation of love, etc., etc. These notions enjoy uh, a central place in the doctrines, theological, and theological package. Um, the Trinity and its components, personhood and relationality, are used in my book as foundational criteria for understanding basically two things in the book. First, our Christian theology of the Trinity dealt with the personhood and relationality, like these notions, personhood and relationality, in the context of the modernist and postmodernist secular understanding of them. Because outside theology, in modernity and postmodernity, we have also uh, anthropologists, psychologists, uh, biologists, uh, people who follow the evolution theory, etc., etc., who also have their own understanding of terms like ego, like self, like soul, like connectedness. And the second question I try to answer in my book, um, by means of the Trinity, is how the Trinitarian notion of unit, unity and self-differentiation can become the most appropriate criterion of correlation between theology and other forms of scientific inquiry. Whenever we speak in the doctrine of the Trinity about the relation between the three, Father, Son, and Spirit, we speak about them as united, as one, but also as particularly distinguished from each other. And that unity and self-differentiation became sort of uh, one of the basic elements in the doctrine of the Trinity uh, to speak about connectedness. So the question I try to explore in my book is how the same logic was used in theology 
and in other forms of inquiry to speak about the relation between theology or religion in general and secular knowledge. So as you can see, this is not a book on the doctrine of the Trinity per se. If um, you want to really read my own interpretation of the doctrine of the Trinity as such, then you have to look at my earlier book. And that's really my interpretation of the doctrine of the Trinity. And the book is called God Without the Face on the uh, Personal Individuation of the Holy Spirit. And that book was published in 2011 by Moore Zebek, the uh, publishers of the University of Tübingen. There I speak about the Trinity. What does it mean? How was it developed? What is the relation of um, the doctrine of uh, uh, the Trinity to the doctrine of the Holy Spirit? And how can we understand as Christians that rather complicated and controversial doctrine? And I have to say, it's controversial not only when we talk to other religions. It's indeed controversial as Dr. Lim was showing us among Christians themselves, you know, Trinitarian and anti-Trinitarian within the, tra the same tradition. Um, the content of my book is basically uh, divided into three main parts. Um, one, well, the root theology and the question of self and modernity. I go back to the beginning of the misunderstanding of the notions of relationality and personhood in the doctrine of God to modernity. And there I, I try to argue in the first part how the modernist uh, rationality, how the modernist uh, uh, thinking about self and ego uh, influenced Christian Trinitarian theology in a negative way. Then in the second part, uh, I speak about uh, how Trinitarian theology faced postmodern discourse. And then in the third part, I put my own proposal in four chapters. Let me take you briefly through every part and tell you what I'm trying to say in each one of them. The first part I call the roots, theology, and the question of self in modernity. And in this part, I go back actually to how a specific understanding of personhood that is derived from a church father in the fifth century called Boethius, and how that father gave us uh, uh, the definition of personhood, which we still use today, which means single, individual, rational being, singleness. And out of that idea of singleness came in modernity the psychological, the philosophical understanding of selfhood. To be self, to be I, is to be self-centered, to be self-sufficient rationally. Um, and that theology interacted with uh, seriously and actually it threatened the doctrine of the Trinity because when you speak about an ego, self-centered, self-sufficient ego, then you don't speak anymore about much a relational me. To be relational means you are not self-sufficient. Um, so in this part, I, um, um, I deal with two things. First, I deal with the relation between Trinitarian theology and some of the intellectual forms of inquiry that are related to the notions of self and personhood in the context of modernity. And then I try to map the roots of the main theological and philosophical hermeneutics of personhood, selfhood, and relationality, which today's postmodernist scholars entertain and emphasize. So whatever we read today actually in books on the Trinity um, in the West, of course, um, are things reacting to that modernist insistence on the singlehood, on the oneness, on the self-sufficiency idea. There is too much emphasis today in <laughs> Trinitarian books on relationality. And that's the postmodernist part, which I try to uh, explain in the second. And the second part I call the challenge because I believe that this attempt in today's Christian theology to um, open bridges of communication with postmodernist forms of inquiry is good, is necessary, is important, is inevitable, but at the same time is risky. It's 
especially when that openness tends to be an attempt at gaining the content, the approval of other forms of inquiry about what theology should say and should not. This is why in this part, which I call uh, the church, the theory of theology in and postmodernity, I try to argue for two main points. First, I try to demonstrate the continuation of the inappropriate relation of theology, modernity, rationale in the postmodernist era without witnessing any substantial transformation. I try to argue actually that if theology was relating to modernity in a reactionary manner, I do believe that theology today is actually relating to postmodernist forms of inquiry with a no less reactionary manner as well. Then the reaction was defending God, protecting the doctrine of God from, from these secular forms of inquiry. In today's postmodernist world, the tendency is not defending anymore, but it's more sort of succumbing to everything the postmodernist uh, 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 forms of inquiry expect us to succumb to. So both are actually reactions and not actions or reactions. And then the second point I tried to argue for is that the clash between um, uh, Trinitarian theology and postmodernist centralization of relationality and otherness is actually a clash that is um, influencing theology of God negatively. There is, rather than anti Trinitarianism in today's theology, there is something which I call um, an attempt at um, accommodating the Trinity to every form of uh, relationality we feel uh, the world identify itself with. Therefore, you can hear today about something called the social theory of the Trinity, for example, or, or, or theologians saying the Trinity is our social program. So like, like the Trinity becomes that model which you apply on, on, on human life and try to make sense of human life by means of it. Um, so what I do basically is I question the theologians' unreserved borrowing of this centralization and applying it slavishly on the Trinitarian doctrine of God. After I do that deconstruction and analysis, I try the third part to put my own proposal. Okay, so is there a solution? Is there a possibility to find a better way to build that interaction? And here I suggest the notion of correlation, which is not my intention, of course. It's a very popular notion. The notion has been used by many theologians and philosophers, and um, uh, the great uh, German-American uh, theologian Paul Tillich is probably one of the most known theologians who use that term. Um, so I, in that part, I suggest correlation as a model of interaction between theology and other forms of scientific inquiry. Correlation, I argue, is the best expression of the Trinitarian understanding of the relation between personal particularity and the relational connection. In other words, that's the right term to understand how can I relate to the other without losing myself in the other or without denying the other's particularity. Correlation, mutuality, reciprocation. And then I suggest in this part to basic um, uh, voices within um, uh, Western um, um, systematic theology, whom I believe do present um, a very balanced and inviting uh, understanding of that correlation. Uh, Jürgen Moltmann and Wolfgang Annenberg. And I find the two appropriate, reliable and balanced uh, uh, theologians who understand the relationship between person and relation and between unity and particularity. That's basically what I try to do and argue for in the book. So, um, 
sorry, when you read the book, and that's actually what I got from uh, uh, those who wrote to me their feedback. When you read the book, you feel there are two layers of arguments just running side by side. And that's true, actually. This is correct. Um, I was inspired by that method, actually, by um, George Limbeck. He wrote a book, it's now classic in Christian uh, theology, it's called The Nature of Doctrines. It's a smaller book, but that book has also this, this idea of having two arguments running in parallel to each other. One of them is a case study for the other. And you know, uh, uh, classical um, systematic theologians don't usually uh, uh, take uh, case studies. They just you know, put a theory, analyze it, and try to systematically uh, offer a good community to it. But Lembe invited me to, to that idea of having one aspect or one idea as a case study. Um, and that this is possible to be done and write still a book on systematic theology. Um, so um, what I do in this book is actually I have two inquiries. One is general inquiry on the relationship between theology and other scientific forms of inquiry, other uh, sciences, basically philosophy and social sciences. And in this uh, general inquiry, what I do is sort of, I theologize on the relation of theology to the context. Because one can theologize on how we do theology as well. And within that uh, basic framework, I have a case study or a specific inquiry, which is basically on the relationship between Trinitarian theology and the main hermeneutical trends of self, of personhood, of relationship, and of otherness. In other words, I try to present a proposal for reshaping the theology context relation from a Trinitarian perspective and by means of Trinitarian notions. For me, that's full of Trinity. For me, that's fully Trinitarian project from A to Z. But it's not on the Trinity, it's by means of the Trinity. And before I stop and welcome uh, Dr. Dean's comments and questions, and then your questions, and I'll be ready to answer any question you have on the Trinity. Um, I would like to read to you a few lines from the introduction of my book, which will tell you also what I'm trying to do in it. It is my hope that this study will invite today's theologians to explore more acutely and critically Christian theology's role in today's context, and to examine whether the strategies of thinking and interpretation we use to do theology today are fairly expressive of the particular nature and claims of Christian faith, or whether they are not. More specifically, I call for doing this examination in relation to the contemporarily developed Christian understanding of the Triune God and its ambition of making an impact on and becoming a referential criterion for understanding the human existence and nature in today's context. The doctrine of the Trinity can undoubtedly transform our understanding of the meaning of selfhood and of otherness and can take a human thinking beyond the limits and the stakes of any contextually limited and one-sided mindset. But the doctrine of the Trinity can do this only when it correlates with other non-theological hermeneutics of human nature and selfhood in a non-hierarchical, non-subordinationist mode of relationality. The doctrine of the Trinity can do this when it reflects theology's uniqueness and maintains theology's integrity. And when it does this with the aid of a relationship hermeneutics based on the unity and self-differentiation correlation between the three divine persons and the eternal God. That emphasis on uniqueness and integrity is 
substantial in my book thesis. And I believe in that even on the level of interreligious dialogue. No real dialogue, well, on any doctrine, but, but the doctrine of the Trinity maybe before anyone, any other one, can be achieved unless we maintain the uniqueness of the Christian and the Muslim uh, um, um, understanding of God, no matter how contradictory they see. And unless we also work hard in our dialogue to respect the integrity of each discourse. So uh, rather than uh, trying to tend toward a polemic approach, like the, the anti trinitarians try to push everyone to work, um, in dialogue, we need definitely to have, uh, to maintain particularity and integrity. And these two things, the Christian theology always talked about in relation to the Trinity. In that relation of love, where in the Father and the Son and the Spirit maintain their unique person, but they respect the other's integrity as well. So that's why the Christian don't speak logically about three fathers, or three sons, or three spirits. I will be open for uh, your questions about the Trinity, and thank you for listening. Um, I named in my book actually some examples of okay. theologians who 
who uh, would um, use these notions of relationality and sociality in ways that will um, reduce God into just uh, an expression of how should we live. Yeah. Yeah. So I name some theologians yeah. that I represent as objectively as I could uh, their theological thinking about um, Yeah, I, I'm not blaming the theologians for borrowing notions from other for, uh, uh, fields of uh, sciences. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying that um, it is just now when theology started talking about relationality and never before. You were absolutely right. Uh, in the fourth century, the Cappadocian fathers um, brought that notion of perichoresis uh, to explain the hypostasis. Yes. Um, but what I'm trying to say in my book is that we theologians tend to borrow these notions loaded with non-theological connotations that may not actually be um, uh, properly reflective of what Christian theology would like to say by means of the same terms. Um, that's my problem. Um, so, for example, or just an example of that, um, in Christian Trinitarian uh, doctrine, we speak about persons in relations, not about persons as relations. Mm, that's right. So that difference that's right, that's right. is really basic to understand the core logic of personal and relationality in Christian theology, for example. That's right. Yeah. Um, yes, Professor. Yeah. Well, what shall I say? You know, the, the books I, I usually love and want to buy are always the books that make me ask questions. And your book really is fascinating because I put seven questions there. <laughs> so so um, uh, this this just really tells you how much I'm, I'm I'm now curious about reading the whole book because I admit I am not much knowledgeable about that period within uh, British theological thinking. Um, it's a great great. Um, um, Exposition, what you're doing there, and very brave, I would say, you know, unpacking all these elements of um, not the uh, theological thinking, but the uh, intellectual driving forces behind it, yeah, yeah. which I think is very important. It shows your historic your character as a historian, because that's what I think historians do. Um, you know, um, you can be historian of ideas, but you can also be a historian of the development of the ideas yes. of how they were developed and all these political yes. contextual reasons behind it. And you seem to be doing that really in a very intriguing, stimulating manner. I, I really can spend the night just asking you these questions and listening to you. But um, I'm just going to um, uh, maybe ask one question if I may. Um, you know, you said that the anti-Trinitarian Protestants, the Puritans, Protestants basically, were, were inviting the Protestant Trinitarian theologians to go to the end of the road, right? Yes, yes. And to deny Trinitarianism. Yeah. Yes. Right. Um, how would they reconcile that in their mind with the fact that within Protestant tradition, Luther and Calvin, the Trinity is present in their theological writing. Yeah. And Luther and Calvin themselves, as you know, yeah. um, were very much immersed into patristic theology. Yeah, sure. So you read, I read Calvin and Luther, I feel I'm reading Gregory Nazianzen, for yeah, example, right. or I'm reading right. John of Damascus. Yeah. Right. Um, so how would these uh, Puritan and Trinitarian reconcile that core, yeah. you know, with that back of Protestant back? Right, so a couple of ways of answering that. One would be, um, to argue that these Protestant, these patristic authorities were not authorities, because the Bible is the ultimate authority. So you can call Gregory Nazianzen, you know, Hilary of Poitiers, or Augustine, it doesn't matter. They were all subsidiary to the authority of the Bible. And so, for example, Sosinus, both Faustus and also Sabitus and numerous others said that Luther began well, but he only went halfway. So the project of the Reformation, if it was designed to be getting rid of all the elements of popery, meaning like Catholic 
kind of vestigial element from the foundation of Christianity, then they went far, but not far enough. Mm -hmm. So for example, a lot of the Anabaptists, right? If you think, if you listen to their hermeneutical kind of method, they said, okay, you got rid of enough things, but there's something else that you had to get rid of, and that is this whole pagan baptism thing. So they felt that they were they were lauding the efforts of Luther and Calvin, for instance, in terms of starting in the right direction. So you were headed in the right direction, but you hadn't gone far enough. So I think for them, and if you think about a lot of the sort of subsequent Protestant traditions, especially of the Anabaptistic kind of order, um, whoever wrote whatever is not that important because if I cannot find it in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, it's not going to have any more authority. So it seems to be that, and also it's not going to be an authority of the scriptural teaching that is mediated through any other personal authority at all. It'll be me, my reading of the text, as the Holy Spirit illuminates my mind. Come what may, the Pope or the Council, I stand on the Word of God, I can do no other, therefore help me God. So it really does seem to raise the question about the birthing of the individual defiance, right? Like, you know, pardon my French, but giving the middle finger to anyone and anything that came, because I know, because God the Holy Spirit told me that I am right. I mean, if you think about this whole notion of, can, are you alone right? You know what I mean? Think about that. Like, let's say all of us in this room, one person, you back there, say, I alone am right. Well, we will say, who are you? I mean, what's your authority? On what basis do you make such an audacious and grandiose claim? Right? And then we're going to claim, I mean, just, and then this is going to be an epistemic debate. Like, you know, how do you know what you know? How do we really know? And so I think what, what these answers are are really unwittingly or what are you doing was undercutting a lot of the existing epistemological structures, the apparatus that undergird the whole thing. In other words, they were also against their own tradition by being under traditions. Yes, 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 that's right, that's right. So okay. Thank you. Now I would like to invite questions and comments from the audience now. When I call upon you, please uh, stand and state your name and give uh, your comment or question. Yes, John. Hi, I'm John Blossom from the mm -hmm. New Blog. Um, and I found both of these presentations quite interesting. Uh, one question that might unite both views is how the postmodernist camp and the anti Trinitarians have and had their own political baggage that enters into the picture. That it was not simply the Niceans who mm -hmm. were responding. In part to a political situation in Venezuela. And we could say, for example, that the postmodernists that uh, Dr. Awad outlines in his book are responding to uh, postmodern libertarian inclinations. Mm -hmm. And we could potentially say that the anti Trinitarians in that era were responding to the, the pressures for statism that gave rise to certain aspects of Luther and Calvin's efforts, as well as the the Counter-Reformation, mm -hmm. uh, the, the establishment of, of, uh, of the name of uh, the domain of the king mm -hmm. in relation to the church. So, you know, there, nobody's closet is clean here, I guess is the yeah. way to put it. Right. And it's specifically, I guess, to the anti-Trinitarians, but in relation to these uh, postmodernists, uh, isn't it true that they have some skin in the game to say, well, if, if we get rid of the Trinitarian, situation, then the king's rule is more absolute, or the state's rule is more absolute, versus the postmodernists saying that if we get, do away with the trinity, then there's no state in the way of the individual doing what they want. Yeah, I'll take that one. I can go to that one. Yeah. Just briefly, I think a lot of these anti-trinitarians that I've read would always claim that they were driven by no other agenda but what they felt the Bible absolutely teaching this doctrine. Now, of course, that, that itself needs to be read with, you know, lots of grains of salt at one level. But um, they really thought, whereas the Trinitarians would say, if you don't believe the Trinity, it'll mean the dismantling of the civil and societal and religious fabric. 
they really had the kind of political ramifications all mapped out. If you don't believe in Trinity, then church and state society will collapse. The anti-Trinitarians would make no kind of grandiose kind of political argument. They said the Bible teaches this, so we must go follow it no matter what the consequence. So their claim to be apolitical maybe is just sort of a, an act of kind of theological In other words, they're a Nicene, they're kind of a self-appointed Nicene council. They were trying to be, I mean, they felt that politics, they, they would say things like the purity of the church uh, went dead in the person of Constantine. So when there's occlusion of the empire and ecclesia, then there's a problem. So they were trying to divorce it. So in other words, absolute separation of church and state is what they're trying to get at. Well, the, to use the word politics in terms of interaction, um, in postmodernity, the political game is different. Um, those uh, theologians I talk about in my book um, are not anti trinitarian They're actually sponge trinitarian as they claim, because they want to argue that the best discourse expressive of relationality is the Trinity, discourse on the Trinity. But the problem, as I believe in their emphasis on the Trinity lies in their hermeneutic, how they interpret the idea of the Trinity. So instead of talking about the Trinity as a discourse on a self-existing, unique, divine being. The Trinity becomes sort of a language game or a, 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 an epistemological basket wherein out of you can get notions that will help you to understand human condition. Right, right. Well, folks, so this is this is not necessarily anti-Trinitarian. See. This is still Trinitarian, but then the understanding of the Trinity and the use of the Trinity is different from how the history of Christian theology used the Trinity. The Trinity has always been the Christian's discourse on first God, who God is. And then uh, um, um, we try to trace the Imago Dei, that image of God in uh, our life without turning God into our life. See? Um, and that's the tricky thing in them. So this is a bit different mm -hmm. political game. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go to the next question. Matthew? Well, yeah, actually, I'm, I'm Matt Laney. I uh, pastor a church here in town. Actually, my question was uh, fairly similar. But first of all, I was just going to observe that uh, whenever we hear about anti Trinitarians in the past, Always has a very high Christology, which is mm -hmm. very refreshing. It still has a very high view of Christ. Yeah. <laughs> this makes me think, gosh, if half the people in my church were that anti Trinitarian, I'd be grateful. <laughs> 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 uh, and and there's, this notion that uh, the, uh, you know, the, the Trinity was either was cooked up worse or codified best at best by Nicaea, mm -hmm. by some power hungry bishops, mm -hmm. and you know, was. By the language. It's a very popular idea these days. I mean, you hear it, yes, it is. over and over. It's popular, it's persuasive, yeah. and therefore I'm completely suspicious of it. Uh, and, and I just got to believe it's more complex yeah. and, and interesting than that. And I'm just waiting for a scholar to uh, prove me right about that. Uh, and I just wonder if you could paint a larger picture uh, yeah. about what's going on, because it, it's almost slipshod now how that gets thrown around. I just wonder if uh, you would draw the picture of, of, of that power. Yeah, so I think that's a very, very astute observation, actually, that uh, one that would that your parishioners were as anti Trinitarian as some of these people were back then in their high Christology, if they meant to that. Two, I think there is a tendency, for example, even I'm a Testament scholar at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Uh, I was there lecturing recently um, at the Religious Studies Department talking about the spiral semitism in the Roman in England and just kind of problematizing some of our received orthodoxies like, well, um, you know, 
early church. Now, it seems to me that when I, so I, I will, I'm an adult coming to Christianity, right? And then when you read the New Testament, let alone the Hebrew Bible, it seems quite clear to me that there is already conflictual mode of coexistence, right? I mean, when in 1 John, the writer of 1 John says, well, they're Antichrist, and that, that doesn't seem like a very inviting, friendly language to me, right? So even in the, within the core of the New Testament itself, the canonized text seem to indicate there is some kind of competition going on, jockeying for true orthodoxy, true version of orthodoxy. Now, I think we get very nervy about that. We, we, uh, our pristine version of religion is every law to get along. Nobody should fight. And every law all right at the same answer all the time. And when we don't do it, then it's nothing to tolerate <coughs> and God cannot be in it. Right? So I think that's the sort of metathesis that has gained greater ascendancy and popularity. And so a lot of, because I, I think at one level it is true though that if you're following, if you're purportedly following the God of love, you shouldn't be lopping off people's head because they don't believe in the Trinity. I mean, I think there are these things, Lindbeck talks about that too, right? If you say that Jesus is Lord and go bash somebody's head, I mean, is that, do you really believe in the worship of Christ? So I think in a way that it is a matter of critique of Christians behaving badly, you know, not just bishops, but does that therefore invalidate the, the claims that this particular religion has made about self and society and savior, and I'd like to differ. So, I mean, I would go that, I mean, I wouldn't try to find it in the Nicaea, you can find it in the New Testament itself. I mean, don't try to find the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Judas as if that new discovery shows that Christians are not always getting along. You just read 1 John. It seems to me when you're calling somebody Antichrist and that's part of your text, that means you weren't, you were having a hard time. Paul calls Peter into, you know, kind of a serious question and call calls him hypocrite and so on. So it seems to me that those questions, as I have know, those questions come up a lot when I write. So on the other hand, I, I, whenever any group invites me to come and talk about Christianity, um, I usually do. Uh, it doesn't mean that I'm an expert in this, but since they took the risk of inviting me, and these questions come up all the time. And because their premise, as I kind of hear more and more, the premise is that true religion means true peace. True peace means that absence of disputes whatsoever. But if you're going to do interfaith dialogue, and I love your school's model, what is that? Exploring differences, deepening faith. Yeah, deepening the faith, and exploring difference. <laughs> something like that. Exploring difference. And I love that deepening faith. By exploring difference, you deepen your faith. Because we tend to think that let's not talk about our difference, because that's how we deepen our faith. I don't think so. So, I'm sure you Yeah, thank you. Um, just two comments, if I may. First, um, there is sort of um, consensual belief today within the theological Christian theological scholarship that there is no doctrine of Trinity in the Bible. So, no, uh, m really, the majority of theologians will tell you there is no doctrine in that. But actually, there is no. There is no doctrine whatsoever in the Bible. <laughs> Neither Christology nor pneumatology, not any doctrine. If we are here talking about the notion of doctrine, as is used in the history of Christian thought to speak later on about the confessional statements, if you, if you see what I mean. So no doctrines here. So that's the second thing is um, yes, the Roman emperor in the 4th century called for a council. But we shouldn't misunderstand that as if telling us that in that council the church started to think about the Trinity. This is wrong. Right. 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 The, the emperor invited for that council because there was a discussion about the Trinity already mm -hmm. yeah. happening Two centuries earlier than that, since the time of, uh, um, you know, and more systematically since the time of origin, for example. So we shouldn't really say because the political uh, ruler called these bishops to come together to make it a, 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 a confession, then then he created the doctrine. He did it. That theological debate has been taking place in the churches and creating these doubts which are permanent and, and many before and Christian Bauer and others in early 20th century talk about. These debates were part and parcel of the life of the community. Who is God? You know? 
And how can we reconcile the language in the Bible about God, wherein uh, our Lord Jesus himself called him Abba, Father, and wherein we read about the Spirit, the Pneuma, right? How can we reconcile this language with how we would like as Christians who are now, by now uh, um, um, dominantly Greek in thought, how can we reconcile that language with that great philosophy? And out of that interaction with the context came the theological speech about the Trinity. Um, but we have to know that this is also the same story with any other doctrine, even Christology. Um, so I'm just trying to say that anti-Trinitarian argument that it's politics that creates doctrine is not exactly historically accurate. Thank you. That's, that's what I think is best. So I'll Any question from this side? <laughs> okay. I, I, I mean, as well, I mean, I've taken a lot of courses here, but I'm a total beginner. Because I want to ask, I wonder how is it, and I um, was unable to come to your portion of the talk. You're in the same phase. But I was just wondering, like when you said, you can have high Christology and no Trinity, I wonder how, how is it possible? Because from my, um, you know, beginner understanding is that high Christology is what led to Trinity. Mm -hmm. That if you, you have a high version of Christ, then that's why you would have to include him as another God or say the very you were asking me. Yes. Okay, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, first of all, it, it all depends on what you mean by high Christology, right? So I think I would say that Arius held to a pretty high Christology compared to a congregation members, maybe. Okay. If you look at the sort of, if you look at the vertical, like asymptotic curve, do you remember it? Like the top, right? So, so Arius argued that it's well. Christ is the first and the highest of all creatures, but there's an asymptotic curve that allows you to get as close to the vertical axis as possible without ever touching it, right? So you get closest to it, but then there is still, so Athenaeus is arguing, but then if there is a kind of ontological and ethical gap between that creature and the creator, then you still need a mediator, according to Athenaeus. So then, no matter how close you are, if you're a creature, then because of the ontological and, and, and ethical gap, you would need a mediator. So I think in some ways, compared to many other subsequent figures, Arius, the chief heretic within the Christian church in inverted commas or without the commas, uh, held to a very high Christology. But by traditionally, when what people mean by high Christology is what you've just enumerated yourself so perfectly. That, um, so Larry Hurtado, who used to teach for a long time at the University of Edinburgh, he has a book, uh, Christ is Lord. Yes, Christ is Lord, but there, in one of the chapters that got republished a lot is that the Bientary and Sheep of Early Christian Worship. So they argue that, well, he kind of makes this pretty compelling case to me that the, the idea of the Trinity, or the idea of high Christology was not born in a seminar or more uh, symposium like this. It happened as Christians began worshiping God full of the Spirit. Right? Worshiping God, traditionally known as Yahweh or the Father. You know, but they felt that to really get to this God, you know, not only ontologically but redemptively, you need a mediator. And so by examining the significance in that worship of God through Jesus in the Spirit, that they began to develop this notion, this triad that was sacramentally there and liturgically beginning to be established. So I've when I used to teach theology, like I used to teach at a school called Gordon Conway Seminary in Boston before going to Vanderbilt nine years ago. When I used to teach at Gordon Conway, I used to say, I used to have students read that article because that to me was one of the best historical, uh, historically kind of reliable, at least to me, way of understanding the, the idea of development doctrine. Right? Because I think a lot of the restorationist Protestants tend to believe that that there is no developmental thesis as Catholics and others hold. So that unless it is found in the New Testament or the Christian scriptures or the Hebrew Bible, that game's over. Whereas some others felt like, well, no, I mean, you can, it's the seed may be there in the Bible, but it kind of grows out of it. 
So I think I kind of have adopted more of the latter, this the center of uh, Hurtado's idea uh, very seriously and very kind of convincing that high Christology was born in that sort of liturgical context. Because to get to this invisible and ineffable God, you need the mediator who is so high, so close. In fact, uh, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. That's sort of Johannine language becoming more and more uh, kind of emblematic of their theological commitment and, and confession as well. But I, I, I fully I agree with that. Just to say that Larry Mortado and others belong to a school of thought within Christian theology we call the third quest of the historical Jesus, mm -hmm. wherein um, many scholars before Larry Mortado as well, um, instead of asking who is the Jesus of history, they ask how the Christian understanding of Jesus developed in history. Mm -hmm. And then you will have high Christology having various interpretation throughout different historical stages. Even today, um, what do we mean by high Christology? That is actually, you know, what do we mean by Jesus is Lord? It's not more than the same thing. So there's a whole scholarship mm -hmm. about that. Yeah. Great. Uh, there are books to be purchased, okay? And uh, we order them at author's price, which means you cannot get them any cheaper. And you don't have to pay shipping a hand. So you can't get anything better than that. So purchase that and come here and get them signed. And if you have questions, you can ask them while they're signing the uh, books. Okay. Let's thank you to wonderful.